Hey folks, thanks for joining us tonight. I'm Dr. Benjamin Lindsay with uh, OrthoSC. I'm an orthopedic foot and ankle uh, surgeon here at OrthoSC. And tonight we'll be talking about how to prevent and treat foot and ankle pain. Throughout the webinar tonight, if you have questions, please uh, send them in through Zoom. If I see them uh, as they come in, I'll answer them uh, at that time. If I miss them though, we'll have time at the end and we'll, we'll touch on uh, all the questions that you have. Um, so don't worry, we'll, we'll get to them uh, if I miss them initially. Just to give you a, a brief introduction to, to who I am and why I'm uh, talking to you about foot and ankle pain, I did my undergraduate uh, studies at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville, Virginia. I'm originally from Virginia Beach, so that was just a move, move, move up upstate in Virginia. I then went to medical school at the Medical College of Virginia, VCU. Uh, that's in Richmond, Virginia. I followed that up with five years of orthopedic surgery residency at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Uh, so go blue uh, if anybody watches watch the game this past weekend. Um, and then I did my foot and ankle fellowship at the Campbell Clinic in Memphis, Tennessee. And the Campbell Clinic was actually the original orthopedic training program in the nation. Um, and so it was a pretty great place to do a final year of training. I joined Ortho SC in September of this year. Um, and my wife and I relocated with our 21-month-old daughter to the Grand Strand back in August of this year. So we've really enjoyed settling in and uh, getting to know uh, the Grand Strand and all it has to offer. Um, as an orthopedic foot and ankle surgeon, when I'm thinking about various problems that uh, patients have throughout their foot and ankle, in my mind, I, I divide things up by where in the foot or in the ankle uh, a patient's having problems. If a patient's having problems towards the front of the foot, there are certain uh, pathologies or certain causes of those problems that are really common and I, I tend to always look for, whether it's on the x-ray, whether it's clinically on exam, whether it's uh, through a thorough history. And so this presentation is problems when I see a patient. We'll start out by talking about problems that occur at the front of the foot, in the toes. We'll move on to problems that occur in the middle of the foot and in the arch. Then we'll move on to problems that occur in the heel. And we'll finish up with problems that tend to occur in the ankle. One of the most common uh, problems I see in the foot uh, is a bunion. And the medical term that you may have heard for a bunion is hallux valgus. It's uh, Latin, uh, but um, a bunion is, is much more uh, commonly the, the description for this problem. And what a bunion is, is to keep it really simple, it's a bump on the inside of the foot by the big toe that can cause pain. And bunions can occur both due to genetic reasons. Uh, so we do actually see bunions in kids uh, and in a pediatric population. Uh, and they can occur also due to shoe wear. They can even occur due to injury. There uh, are plenty of high-level athletes, such as NFL, uh, as for a term of their big toe while playing and can develop a bunion from that. Uh, what happens with a bunion is if you look at the diagram on the lower left of your screen, the bone labeled metatarsal bone starts to shift outwards. Uh, we've also realized that that bone tends to rotate. And then in response, the toe bones labeled the phalanx bones tend to shift outwards and you get an angling of the bones, uh, which causes that bump. And um, 
once the bones shift, the soft tissues in the foot also tend to contract and there are lots of changes that go along with just those two bones shifting uh, that make the, the problem a pretty complex problem. Um, a question that I'm very frequently asked is, um, once I've started to develop a bunion, can I prevent it from getting worse? Um, and to kind of review, unfortunately, getting a bunion from occurring in the place is not something that we can do. Um, like I mentioned, there's a genetic predisposition uh, that just can leave uh, certain folks susceptible to developing a bunion. Can you prevent them from getting worse? That question is actually debated. There are lots of products, and I'll show you some in my next slide, um, that uh, offer solutions to try and correct bunions. Unfortunately, once you have a bunion, none of these products can correct the bunion or straighten back out those bones. It is debated whether those products can worse that. Um, if, if you see that the uh, power, uh, some what we are to the right, there will occur your bumps, how the toe starts to rotate the toe in the bottom uh, right photos. And you also see how the second toe, um, so as it gets worse, it starts to affect the other toes. And um, the bunion getting worse can lead to hammer toes and crossover toes, which we'll talk about a little bit. Um, lots of one simple fix is wearing shoes with wide toe boxes. Um, and they don't have to be the clown shoes pictured in the photo. Um, there are actually lots of brands now uh, that tend to shape their shoes a little bit wider. Um, and um, I can certainly point you in the direction of those types of shoes if you come to see me in clinic. If you go onto Amazon, there are countless numbers of toe spacers, uh, which is that silicone device uh, seen in the upper right photo under uh, non-surgical treatment uh, and bunion pads that can uh, temporarily straighten out the toe and make shoes more comfortable to wear. There are even nighttime splints as seen in the bottom uh, photo. Under Those are also available on it. And and you can um, straighten that temporarily, whether they can spin from getting worse. Um, but unfortunately, none of these treatments can uh, straighten out the toe permanently. The only solution we have to straighten out the toe permanently is surgery. And there are over a hundred bunion operations described because bunion surgery is actually pretty tricky surgery. Um, like I mentioned, the bones aren't just shifting, they're rotating, the soft tissues are changing. So it's a whole balancing act in surgery. Um, we actually have made some uh, significant progress in recent years uh, as far as medical technology goes in treating bunions. And what that is, is uh, minimally invasive bunion surgery. So uh, some bunions uh, that tend to be on the mild to moderate uh, spectrum of bunions are amenable to this minimally invasive surgery. And what it is, is we use a small burr through um, approximately four to five millimeter incisions to shift the bone uh, back. Um, and then we fix that bone in place again through very small incisions with screws. That's opposed to more traditional bunion surgeries where we're still shifting bones in a lot of cases um, to undo kind of that, that shift I demonstrated earlier. But previously we were using incisions and instead of being a few millimeters in length, 
uh, or centimeters in length. With the um, smaller incisions, it doesn't change the success rate of bunion surgery, but it um, certainly improves pain and swelling after surgery and leads to fast debilitation. When to pursue surgery for a bunion is, is a bit of a tricky question, but there's a really easy rule to go by. Um, bunion surgery for cosmetic reasons is tends to not be as successful as bunion surgery for pain reasons. And the golden rule for surgery on either toes or bunions is um, the more the bunion is hurting you or the more your toe is hurting you, the more successful the surgery will be. So I typically tell people uh, if, when they ask me if their bunion's gonna get worse, I'll talk them through that based on what type of bunion they have uh, that's a little bit specific to the bunion, but when folks ask me, should they get surgery now? Should they wait? Really, it's about how painful is this for you? How much is it affecting your life? And if it's at that point where it's significantly impacting you due to pain and physical function, that's the time to, to proceed with bunion surgery. Most bunion surgeries, you're actually able to walk right away, but overall, it's a, a doing yoga, things like that, and if you commitment uh, time-wise involved. I've already started uh, to touch upon um, issues with the toes, but there are lots of different problems that can occur with toes, frequently in conjunction with bunions. You've probably all heard the, the term hammer toes, mallet toes, claw toes before. What those all refer to is different deformities of the toes. Um, if you look at the photos on the, uh, on the right, the bottom right is a claw toe, the upper right is a mallet toe, and the upper left is a hammer toe. Um, the big issue that can occur with any of these toe deformities is pain, and also because of these changes to the toes, ulcers can start to form either on the top of the toes or on the bottom of the toes. These again, unfortunately, you really can't prevent these from occurring. Uh, frequently uh, in the second toe, um, a toe deformity occurs because a bunion's formed and is pushing the toe out of place. Um, Additionally, there's a large genetic predisposition to these toe deformities, just as there is with a bunion. Um, so just like a bunion, really you can't prevent these from forming uh, and you can't get these toes to straighten out again without surgery. Um, luckily, there are lots of non-operative ways to treat those mallet toes Claw toes. Um, I under non treatment, there are multiple devices. Uh, the boot and splint, and the upper left, a hammer toe, a hammer toe silicon tubes in the on the bottom photo. All of these devices can be successful in alleviating pain. Uh, and preventing ulcers from forming with hammer toes. Um, but each of these devices is a little bit specific for certain toe deformities. So one thing that uh, I'll walk you through if you come in is which device is best for you. We have a lot of these uh, treatment devices in our office, and I also try and direct people to where they can purchase these items online um, just so that uh, folks don't have to keep coming back to see me uh, when they wear out uh, one of these older devices. Again, like a bunion, the only way to permanently straighten out a toe is um, through surgery. And in the photo on the far right, uh, you can see that typically what this entails is we go in and actually take out uh, one of the joints, the knuckles of the joints, and we pin the toes straight. Um, we also tend to uh, balance some of the ligaments that are in the toes and uh, do um, a lot more work than that because, again, it's not just the bones that are crooked. It's also, also the soft tissues. Um, 
but after surgery, it's a surgery you can walk immediately. Um, you do typically have pins in your toes that are removed at four weeks, so nothing permanently stays in your toes. Um, and again, it's, it's about uh, three months before you're really going back to all activities without, without thinking about your toes. Um, one issue that commonly occurs due to bunions and hammer toes is called metatarsalgia. And that's a broad, broad term to describe pain under the balls of the feet. Um, so a lot of the time, this can be due to a bunion. And because of the rotation and movement of the bones, your foot becomes unbalanced and you start putting weight in parts of doesn't like other times uh, pain in the balls of the foot uh, can be caused uh, due to tightness in the calf muscles. I see that very commonly. Um, as we age, our calf muscles become stronger and our heel cord, our Achilles tendon becomes a little bit tighter. And that just simply puts more pressure and we walk more. Another reason for pain under the balls of the feet um, is that uh, as uh, we age, the natural fat padding that lies under the balls of the feet tends to shift to where it's no longer actually padding the balls of our feet. So the bones become a little bit prominent. Um, finally, um, pain in the balls of our feet can be caused due to a nerve issue. Um, there's a little nerve that tends to run between the bones in that same area and can become pinched by the bones. When that nerve becomes pinched, it enlarges, becomes irritated, and can cause significant pain, and that's called a Morton's neuroma. So there are a lot of a lot of different things that can cause pain in this area. And so, by a, a physical exam, um, X-rays, we can get down to the to what in particular is causing uh, pain in the balls of the feet. Um, can you prevent pain in the balls of the feet? or metatarsalgia. Um, this, you actually can prevent this pain for certain causes. So with calf tightness, you can prevent and treat it through stretching exercises. Um, and for folks who come in with this, I, I give them a handout and walk them through the correct stretching exercises. Um, nerve pain from a Morton's neuroma, unfortunately, really there's, there's not uh, a great way to prevent it, but there are steroid injections that we can do to um, calm down the nerve and um, at up to about three to five years, one injection uh, results in 50% of people uh, having minimal pain. Um, and then there are certain pads uh, in the bottom right photo under non-surgical treatment are what are metatarsal cookies. And these um, can kind of replace that, that fat padding that should be protecting the balls of your feet and shift weight into other parts of your feet. Uh, so these pads or other pads I sometimes use with folks and sometimes it's even custom orthotics, but there are lots of ways to um, treat uh, pain from metatarsalgia, whatever the cause, without surgery. If the pain persists in uh, is recalcitrant to all, all non-surgical management. Depending on the cause of the pain depends on the treatment. Um, for tight calf muscles, sometimes we'll do a quick procedure to lengthen the calf. Um, for prominent bone on the bottom of the foot, we'll shave off the bone. Um, and for inflamed nerves, we, we take out the nerve and actually um, cut a ligament that tends to put pressure on that nerve. Um, these are all outpatient procedures um, with recovery times that really depend on what the specific procedure is. Um, but um, pain in the balls of the feet really is, it's a, an, a large number of problems that can cause it and really hard to get to the, to the bottom of what's causing it. Um, the last thing to mention is toe fractures. I, I think we've all been there. It's dark. You're trying to turn a light on and you stub your toe. Um, and, you know, unfortunately with a toe fracture, there's no way to prevent it from happening. It's, it's an accident. Um, and really 
when you come to see me for it, if you have a big swollen toe from, from kicking anything, there are a couple of things that I'm really looking at. The first is if you look at that x-ray on the left and then compare it to the right, you can see the His bones are really, really crooked. So that's one, one thing that we're setting it in a um, way. I also look at um, your bones on x ray to make sure that the way that the bone's broken wouldn't lead to a hammer toe deformity. That's a frequent complication from breaking a, a toe and not treating it. And that can lead to persistent pain or those ulcerations we saw earlier in the slide on hammer toes. Most of the time, though, for a broken toe, uh, um, the best therapy for swelling, stiffness of that post op shoe. If you try and bend it, you can't. Um, protects the toe. And sometimes toe taping, uh, which can hold the toe if we've reset it back in place. Um, finally, if, if the toe is really out of place, sometimes we do have to pin the toe surgically. Uh, and um, straighten out the toe and place a pin in it for four weeks to get it to heal uh, in, a, in a straight fashion. And that prevents your toe from being crooked or from uh, developing problems down the road. Um, moving on to kind of the middle of the foot, midfoot arthritis is uh, a very common problem. Um, what it is is the joints in the middle of our foot actually compared to our hip, our knee, our toe joints, they really don't move at all. Um, especially the, the inside joints, they have no movement um, beyond just a few degrees. That said, um, the cartilage can wear down and commonly this uh, occurs due to a, an injury to the foot, such as a twisting injury that uh, you had when you were a teenager and kind of ignored and your foot got better. But little injuries like that can unfortunately lead to the cartilage prematurely wearing out in these joints. Despite these joints only having a few degrees, once the cartilage is worn out, you have bone on bone uh, rubbing in these joints and that few degree of, degrees of motion rubbing bone on bone can cause pain. And why that is, is uh, nerve endings in the bone um, can cause significant pain. Um, this typically causes pain that uh, is an aching pain. It's worse when you're on your feet, uh, even more down into your toes and up into your ankle. Um, Again, this pain is commonly caused due to an injury a long, long time ago. Um, each joint is a cartilage wear out in this of disease, um, diseases that really we can't prevent, unfortunately. So there's no preventing the development of midfoot arthritis. That said, there are lots of little things to do to um, prevent midfoot arthritis from uh, preventing you from uh, living your life in the way that you want to live it. Um, the first thing that um, I walk patients through is that most of the time, um, midfoot arthritis feels much better with a very stiff shoe. So I tend to talk to patients about their shoe wear. I'll inspect a uh, clinic. Uh, and we'll review shoes that are, are very stiff. And a stiffer shoe can be very helpful. Um, what it does is it stops those joints from, you, from moving those few degrees. There are also carbon fiber plates um, that can be purchased just, uh, online. Move straight stiff. A lot of the time when you have midfoot arthritis, uh, bone spurs start to occur on the top of the foot, and these can be really irritating with uh, closed-toed shoes. Thus, I talk with patients about certain ways to lace up shoes that can improve pain. 
There are topical anti-inflammatories that y'all may have used for your hip or your knee. Um, the skin over the foot is very thin. So these topical anti-inflammatories actually tend to work better in the foot than they do in, in other parts of the body. Um, sometimes we consider injections into these joints uh, of steroids, which can calm down pain. And then finally, um, the treatment uh, for these painful joints, if it gets to a point where it's really preventing folks from, say, just doing the things they love, such as walking on the beach, walking their dog, or anything else, is we knit these joints together, or fuse the joints together. Um, as I mentioned before, these joints have very little motion, um, and so we take the joints and turn what was multiple bones into a single bone, and because that joint's gone and there are no bone endings with free nerves, it takes away the pain. Uh, and it doesn't change the biomechanics of the foot. Um, another very common problem in the middle of the foot is uh, breaking the outside bone in the foot or the fifth metatarsal bone. Um, this bone is, uh, if you look at the image, it's the outside bone in the foot. And we typically break this uh, by rolling the ankle or rolling the foot. So again, like a toe fracture, this is an accident and unfortunately not something we can really prevent. Um, this bone, uh, when you come to see me or another foot and ankle surgeon, we divide this bone up into certain zones. And most of the breaks in this bone occur in that zone one, 93% of them. And that's a good zone. The reason why is this bone in zones two and zones three has poor blood supply and blood brings the nutrients that allows our bones to heal. Um, so in the setting of poor blood supply, the bone does not like to heal. Um, so luckily most of the time the bone breaks in the area where it likes to heal, but that's something we look at on x-ray and it, um, seeing that x-ray in um, determining where that bone is broken does help determine a uh, course of rehab from a broken bone. Most of the time, if this bone's broken, um, we get you into a walking boot. We let you start putting weight immediately. And then I talk you through function, and that is, is vitamin D and calcium. And I make sure that you're taking the right amounts to heal this bone. Um, the reason why is uh, we go into that boot is there's a tendon that inserts into that bone that can pull on the bone. And then like that post-op shoe I showed you earlier, the, the boot is really stiff. You can imagine the bone as it starts to heal like a paperclip. And if you start to wiggle a paperclip, you can break that paperclip pretty easily. The same thing goes for this bone. In certain situations, especially when the bone breaks in the area with the bone does not then actually put a screw uh, for the most part, usually a plate and screws to get it to heal. But we on it after time for the incision uh, and that reliably gets that. Um, you can see a, a photo of that screw and then another photo uh, of that screw in, or an x-ray of that um, screw inside of a bone. Um, moving on to stress fractures are um, tend to occur due to repetitive trauma to a bone. And by trauma, I just mean daily wear and tear on a bone. Very commonly, they occur in the other metatarsal bones in the foot, so the middle bones in the foot. Uh, and they tend to start off as small little breaks in the bone. Uh, might not eventually accumulate. Most when a person has um, pain from a stress fracture, the break in the bone is so small, it doesn't even show up on x-ray. Um, patients with stress fractures um, tend to tell me that they just started a new walking program or exercise program. They just switched to a new pair of shoes. 
And all of a sudden, out of the blue, they developed pain in the middle of their foot, accompanied by swelling. These symptoms also are very, very similar to the symptoms of a flare in midfoot arthritis, though, so it can be confusing without the help of an x-ray or an exam to determine the exact cause. Stress fractures can be prevented, and one thing to do to prevent them is to really keep up on your bone health. Um, the simple things to do are by taking vitamin D and calcium, also seeing your primary care physician uh, for a bone density scan and making sure you work with them on your bone health can help prevent stress fractures. can help prevent stress fractures. If you do have a stress fracture, similar to a break in the fifth metatarsal bone or that break on the outside of your foot, we get you uh, optimized as far as your bone health goes. And we get you into a very stiff post-op shoe uh, due to that paperclip effect to allow the bone time to heal. Um, these typically take about four to six weeks to heal. Um, in very rare cases, they don't. And in those cases, then we go in with plates and screws and uh, fix the bone. Um, but that is, that's very rare. Typically, these respond very well to uh, non-operative management, non-surgical management. Going to the heel, um, a really common problem is plantar fasciitis. And what that is, is irritation where the plantar fascia comes off of the heel bone. The plantar fascia is a really tight band of tissue that run, runs from the heel bone out to the toes. It is actually confluent when we're younger with the Achilles tendon, meaning they're, uh, they join as structures. And what tends to cause the plantar fascia becoming irritated where it comes off the bone is our calves becoming tight as we age. You can imagine when we step down every day, if our calves become tight and our foot doesn't run, there's a lot of pressure on this tight band of tissue or this tight rope that comes off the heel. It's being pushed up on, pushed up on, pushed up on. And uh, after a while, it can kind of fray similar to a rope. That's what tends to happen with plantar fasciitis. And when that happens, your body uh, causes a lot of local inflammatory mediators to go there and you get into a repetitive cycle of pain. Um, plantar fasciitis can be prevented by stretching out your calves and um, wearing uh, really supportive shoe wear. And how to treat it um, is by getting at the cause uh, of the plantar fasciitis. And like I mentioned, that's typically having a really tight calf muscle. So the treatment's designed to stretch out the calf muscle. Um, if you come to see me for plantar fasciitis, I walk you through uh, stretching exercises aimed at the calf tightness. We walk through stretching exercises aimed at the plantar fascia itself. Um, one thing that's really, really helpful and has the best evidence of any treatment for plantar fasciitis uh, is actually a night splint. So I, I direct folks on how to obtain one and how to wear one. One certain insert, we talk about icing. And in most cases, after six to eight weeks of stretching, icing, um, using this night splint, plantar fasciitis calms down. When it doesn't, um, that's when we start considering treatments such as injections. Um, injections can calm down that inflammation, but they're not getting at the root cause of the plantar fasciitis in most cases, and thus uh, the stretching is still really important. More than two injections can also risk rupturing the plantar fascia, which is a, a pretty big problem if it occurs. Um, and uh, so thus we're, we're pretty uh, strict in when we do the injections uh, as foot and ankle surgeons, and uh, we also limit you to two of them in the plantar fascia. There are a lot of other problems that can also masquerade as plantar fasciitis. 
in some cases that can be compression of a nerve that diagram on the right um, that yellow structure is a nerve that runs down and close to the plantar fascia um, so in uh, some rare cases that nerve is actually being compressed uh, and we have to go in and surgically release that nerve um, sometimes we do have to go in for plantar fasciitis that lasts beyond about eight months and release part of the plantar fascia um, uh, and sometimes there are actually other issues such as breaks in the heel bone that can masquerade as uh, plantar fasciitis. And that's why it's really important to get x-rays. And if things aren't getting better or seem a little bit atypical on exam, uh, I have a pretty low threshold to obtain an MRI uh, for plantar fasciitis just to make sure that um, something, something unusual isn't going on. Um, that MRI scan on the right is actually showing you a stress fracture in the heel bone. Um, and that's something commonly that on exam I pick up um, that masquerades as plantar fasciitis. And that uh, requires a very different treatment than plantar fasciitis. Um, so a, a break in the heel bone can come from a, typically from a hall, fall from a height but it also can occur just due to general wear and tear on your foot. Generally in those settings, um, there's a little bit of a bone health issue. You might be low on vitamin D or have um, uh, low bone density. Um, so keeping up with bone health is um, really key to preventing kind of the wear and tear stress fractures in the calcaneus or the heel bone. Um, and um, heel bone breaks are very, very painful injuries. Um, and occasionally, if they extend into the joint, the lower ankle joint, they can cause significant arthritis there. And they can also, um, if not treated, they can uh, fail to heal or cause kind of changed um, mechanics in, in walking. And so we, we like to uh, diagnose these quickly and treat these quickly. Um, most of the time for a heel bone fracture, um, if the bone is not significantly shifted, uh, which is the case in nearly all stress fractures, uh, we'll reach out with, uh, a, with a mobile on the patient, we optimize the heel. In heel bone fractures that occur from a fall, fall from a height that go into the lower is typically with plates and screws as shown in that x-ray on the right. Um, when we go for um, we to pain in the Achilles tendon. And the Achilles tendon uh, is, is the biggest tendon in the lower leg. It's that stout rope that runs from your calf muscles down to your heel bone. And that just through general wear and tear and through developing a, a tight calf can become inflamed. Now there are two spots it gets inflamed in. It either gets inflamed in the middle of the tendon itself or where the tendon uh, attaches to the heel bone. And the treatment for Achilles tendonitis is different depending on where that tendons become inflamed. Um, this problem, like plantar fasciitis, can be very, very painful, especially with walking up hills or rising um, from uh, a seated position. Um, it can cause enlargement of the heel bone in the back. And prevention, just like with plantar fasciitis, is typically through keeping your calf nice and loose through stretching. Um, treatment, um, I have a very specific protocol um, that I like to have uh, folks do if they're able to called eccentric strengthening. Um, but it takes time a lot of the time to calm down the inflammation uh, that's occurring with the Achilles tendon before we can start this treatment protocol. So for that, we use the night splint, 
we use heel lifts, we use icing, we use gentle stretching, lots of other treatments, medications uh, to get the inflammation calmed down to permit um, the eccentric stretching exercises. Most of the time, um, depending on the location uh, in the Achilles tendon, this inflammation can be calmed down. In cases where it can't be calmed down by uh, months of uh, non-surgical treatment, sometimes this problem does require surgery. And um, in those cases, we do go in, we remove bone spurs, we clean up the tendon, we reattach the tendon. Um, and you can see in that x-ray on the right how that bone spur uh, has been removed uh, going from the left photo on the left to the photo on the right. Um, next, uh, we have ankle arthritis. This tends to uh, cause pain with any weight bearing, so any walking, any standing on the ankle. It's an achy pain that gets worse the more you're on your ankle. Um, and what it is, is similar to midfoot arthritis, it is Um, that causes uh, uh, bone on bone arthritis, where the nerve endings are really, really painful. Um, in most cases, uh, about 85% of the time, ankle arthritis occurs due to a prior injury to the ankle. So that could be breaking the ankle, an ankle sprain, any kind of number of injuries to the ankle, but most of the time ankle arthritis occurs because of a prior injury. Um, ankle arthritis, when it gets bad and causes significant pain, um, can cause loss of motion in the ankle and can cause you to change your gait significantly, which can also lead to pain in the hip and pain in the back due to walking uh, with an abnormal gait. Again, um, unfortunately, there's no great way to treat ankle arthritis because it does occur due to an injury. Um, but once someone has ankle arthritis, we do have a lot of treatment options. Um, activity modification, most patients are already changing their activity due to pain in the ankle when they come to see me. Um, but Steroid injections can certainly calm down and have a very long lasting effect for ankle arthritis. That's what that x-ray on the upper left uh, of the screen shows. It shows a steroid injection. There are also specific braces that can really help with ankle arthritis. Again, like the midfoot arthritis, the pain that's caused by this bone on bone rubbing occurs with motion and these braces, um, the one on the right is an over the shelf brace. The one on the left is a custom fitted brace um, that prevent that motion and thus prevent pain uh, in the ankle joint. If pain from that ankle arthritis is significantly limiting quality of life though, that's when we start to talk about surgical treatment. Um, it used to be that the only surgical treatment that we had for ankle arthritis was fusing the joint together. These days though, we have very good ankle replacement options, just uh, like we do for the knee and for uh, the hip. Um, that image on the right is um, an image of the ankle replacement I use most frequently. Um, and what that is, is a piece of metal that covers the lower bone and the ankle joint, a piece of metal that covers the upper bone in the ankle joint and a piece of plastic that simulates cartilage in between them. Um, ankle replacement uh, surgery uh, typically takes about an hour and a half to two hours. Um, uh, while it's really an outpatient surgery, uh, we typically uh, have to do it inpatient uh, due to insurance companies. Um, and uh, you have to be off your feet for four weeks after it. Um, but it's one of my favorite surgeries to do because um, patients feel so much better after the surgery. Ankle arthritis can be really, really painful. Um, and it's really rewarding for me to, to see patients um, at their first post-operative appointment where uh, they, their pain significantly improved. Um, 
ankle replacements these days, um, and we actually, the technology has come so far, we don't know um, how long they last. Um, we have really good data saying that they're pretty long lasting, but um, they have, we haven't figured out how long, long that is because they're, they're lasting longer than our expectations for them. Um, finally, moving on to ankle bone, uh, fracture and break uh, are synonymous. Uh, the, the medical term is a fracture, but um, uh, we typically say just a break um, in day-to-day -day conversation. But a break in the ankle is where you break either the inside, the outside bone in the ankle, and sometimes you can break actually the back part of the ankle joint. Um, depending on uh, on search or whether we can treat it just for a walking boot or a cast. Similar to breaks in other bones, this is not something that you can prevent. Although we do, do know if you keep up with uh, bone health uh, and make sure your bones a little bit stronger through vitamin D and calcium and checking bone scans with your primary care doctor, you tend to have less you do. So again, that um, um, what I would term a stable break in the ankle. Um, then we treat you typically with a walking boot. Most of the time we let you start walking right away and we make sure that you're taking calcium and vitamin D so that your bones heal well. If it's a not stable break in the ankle, typically due to breaking both the inside and the outside or the inside, the outside and the back of the ankle joint, then we treat that with surgery and typically that's plates and screws. Sometimes uh, for certain breaks, we use simulated ligaments. Um, that's what that um, little rope is in the diagram on the right, running from the, the between the two bones. That's called a, uh, a tight rope. And that's what uh, anyone remembers to a uh, Tago Valoa's ankle injury that he had surgery for before for the BCS National Championship game a couple years. That's um, that's kind of the the really really quick foot and five what problems are, what the possibilities are when you have pain in certain spots, um, ways to prevent um, the preventable foot and ankle problems, and also what the treatment options are. Um, I'll uh, check and see now if we have any questions, and I, it sounds like we do have some questions. Um, Dr. Lindsay, some of the, a few questions that have come in across email, is it okay for a salon to remove dead skin from an ingrown toenail? So that's a great question. Um, dead skin is one thing, and I, that's okay. If the toenail is ingrown, though, I would uh, recommend not allowing the, the salon to um, dig out the toenail on their own. I would come in and see either an orthopedic foot and ankle surgeon uh, or a podiatrist. Um, there is a risk of infection um, if uh, the toenail itself, the nail, is, is dug out um, without uh, doing it properly. Um, dead skin, though, is, is certainly okay. Um, I know feet can be very hard to reach and get down there for, for maintenance. Okay, another question. If a bunion is surgically removed, can it come back? That's another great question. So um, it can come back. Um, and that's part of the reason why there are well over 100 different operations described bunion surgery. It's because we, we don't have the perfect solution yet. Bunions are, again, just they're really tricky problems and you really want to go to the, the right person to have them fixed because of that. Um, depending on the type of bunions, I, I didn't get into this. Um, um, we look at uh, certain joints in the foot, how much motion you have, and um, 
a surgical solution for a bunion is very specific to the bunion itself. Um, there, outside of the minimally invasive bunion surgery that I, I do for mild to moderate bunions that are standard bunions, I do um, a, um, a procedure called a lapidus where I fuse a joint and derotate the entire toe. Um, I do a, an open procedure called a distal chevron. I do an Aiken procedure. Um, and um, I do all of those different procedures for very specific bunions with the goal of preventing them from coming back. Uh, unfortunately for any surgeon, um, bunions can recur. Um, the good news is that most of the time if bunions recur, they are not painful. Um, so um, when um, this tends to not cause pain, which is um, a relief for myself and other surgeons. Okay, I have another question. Um, Dr. My toes come in sooner than later. A little background, I do not have diabetes. I've had no injury. Is there a nerve test that I should be asking about? So for, for numb toes, um, that was um, great to point out the lack of diabetes. A lot of the time, um, what's called neuropathy or, or numbness uh, caused by degeneration in nerves uh, that are far out from the spinal cord uh, can be caused by diabetes. That, um, neuropathy can also be caused by um, living a great life and, and aging. Um, if we live long enough, we all get a, a touch of neuropathy, but we do actually mission of the nerve and then, um, one one question I had was in regards to um, Achilles uh, tendonitis and the stretching exercises um, that I discuss with patients um, depending on I actually have general stretch uh, exercises that I, I give to um, nearly every patient who comes in uh, pain in their Achilles tendon. Um, get, uh, the lesion and severe of their own. Now when I have them uh, do the or strengthening ball is um, the uh, specific pathology or state where in the tendon their inflammation is and um, the, the certain level of inflammation associated with it. Uh, so it's a, it's a very patient specific approach for treating um, pain in the Achilles tendon and issues with the Achilles tendon. I have another question. My daughter plays soccer at the high school here, and her big toe always hurts when she pushes off. Is there anything we can do besides tape? So um, there are a lot of different possibilities for what cause big toe pain on. What I would say is it very helpful to uh, check in x-ray. Uh, for that issue. There are little uh, bones called sesamoids that live below the big toe. Um, they're kind of like kneecaps for the big toe, and uh, those can get injured and, and hurt. Um, an exam, looking at the sesamoids, uh, uh, structure called the planar plate below the toe, very helpful to determine the cause of the pain along with an x-ray. Um, and that's something that sometimes we get an hour. Um, and they're kind of depending on the cause uh, of the problem based on exam, history, x-rays, really depends on how 
uh, what the treatment involves for that issue. Last question. Lightning feeling on the bottom of my foot started about a week ago. No injury. The bottom of my foot feels really. Should I come in or wait it out? Yeah, so certainly um, that would be a great reason to come in. Any any pain, um, any concerns are always a great reason to come in. That's, um, you know, lots of different reasons. You could have that zinging pain, um, plantar fasciitis, stress fracture. And that's what's really helpful about seeing a patient, um, doing a physical exam, checking some quick x-rays. Um, it, it can really help us to what's going on. And, um, you know, we're not always perfect, but we can certainly add on what uh, certainly um, anyone who wants to reach out to us, I can back the slide, slide up. Um, you can contact us, I think, um, through uh, our telephone number, which I think is listed in one of these. Um, is there one with a telephone number to contact us? Um, yes, it's um, it's eight four three. So our our number is eight four three. Three five three. Three five three. Uh, that number of written and then mm -hmm. um, the other if someone was left um, again, take um, next week so they can actually. Uh, Y'all weren't, I'm not projecting across the room. Um, the webinar will be loaded on our website in about a week. So give us, give us a week. We can get a website. Uh, All right. Well, thank you all for uh, tuning in tonight. Um, I hope this was very beneficial for you all. And if anything in, in your feet or in your ankles is bugging you, uh, give us a call and come in and see us. Thank you all.